Hi and welcome to a week in which live delivery of content takes a break, there are no live lectures and there are no live practicals. The reason we take a break in this week is that, well simply, many students need a break. In week five I found in the past that many students are very distracted by the number of assessments that they have to work on and often students are very stressed. What I tend to see too in the past, or have seen in the past in week five, is that attendance at PRAX tends to really take a nosedive. So instead of wearing that decline in attendance anyway, it's best for us to give you a little bit of space in week five so that you can work on assessment for this course and for other courses as well. Bear in mind that the quiz is open and ready for you to complete. That quiz, as you might already know, requires the use of data we collected on Black Mountain, the application of knowledge of how to calculate tree height, as well as knowledge around confidence intervals, what they are, how to interpret them, and how to calculate them. That means that you need to be across the content that we've covered both in lectures and online in the pre-prac lessons. As well, you need to be on top of the method that we applied in computer sessions to generate data summaries. In particular, if you haven't seen the second lecture from week four, before you attempt the quiz, make time that you make sure that you've made time to watch that lecture, because that lecture in particular will help you step through not only calculation of a confidence interval, but also how to generate a data set that's appropriate for it. But on to the content for this session. Now I'm going to keep this pretty short. We have two pieces focused on experimental design. Now these are not intended to be exhaustive lectures covering all aspects of how to design experiments. But from a statistical perspective, from a statistical conceptual perspective, this lecture covers the key elements that we need to bear in mind when we're thinking about experimental design. How to design experiments in particular, well, you have to take on other courses for that. But this, at least, is an introduction to the issues. By now, I imagine you've probably had a look at your Shinrin Yoku paper as well. If you haven't had a look at it, please take time to do that before the teaching break. During the teaching break, I find myself occupied with all sorts of things, marking, preparing content, and so on. But it's a good time for you to take time out to read your Shinrin Yoku paper. If you have not accessed it yet, if you haven't looked at that email that I sent to you yet, if you haven't found that email yet, make sure that you do that as soon as possible. If you can't find the email in which I have sent the title of your paper to you, email me, let me know, and I'll send it to you again. So Shinrin Yoku, is, as you can see behind me, the taking in of forest atmosphere, forest bathing. It's not getting out there and getting into a bathtub or a shower. It is bathing yourself in the environment of a forest, taking time without any purpose, without any particular goal, taking time to just be in that space. Now, there was, well, a few years ago in particular, there was a movement around Shinrin Yoku in particular. They had a sort of a bit of a moment in which people, even the Duchess of Cambridge at the time, got on board the idea of Shinrin Yoku, a traditional practice in Japan. But of course, the idea of taking in the environment and appreciating the environment isn't something that is specific to Japanese culture. It is embedded in many cultures, many indigenous cultures, such as our, as our own Australian indigenous cultures are embedded in engaging with nature and being part of processes on country. So beyond that, cultures such as Germany, Finland, other countries around the world all have recognised practices within their historical cultures that have emphasised time spent in nature. Now, the apparent benefits are both physiological and psychological. 
And there is an emerging body of literature, or there certainly was in the 90s and then into the early 2000s, this body of literature that tried to describe why that was and then also test the effects. Now, there are a couple of theories around why being in nature might have the benefits it does. One put forward by Kaplan is the attention restorative theory, in which being in nature removes all the stimuli that place a constant demand on our mental faculties, giving our mind a break so that we can recover from mental fatigue. Ulrich, however, suggested a slightly different perspective, that it was actually a, a stress recovery approach. That is, that it gave our physiological system the chance to recover from being perpetually in this flight or fight response. Analogous, perhaps, you might think that the two are the same, but there are quite nuanced differences between them. And if you like, you can have a look for those papers online. This additional idea, Wilson, for example, suggests that, well, we as human beings, as living, evolved organisms, we have this embedded history, an innate connection with nature. Well, the interesting thing is that it, we don't need to be in nature to experience a Shinrin-yoku type effect. So the question about whether it is nature itself that initiates these kind of responses is, is an open question. You can imagine then that there is a very large body of literature that is focused on, especially in the setting of a modern society in which the pressures associated with constant email and phones and the stimuli that are around us all the time are placing additional loads on our mental as well as our stress responses. Now, there, is, there are important effects apparently associated with Shinrin Yoku, but the questions we have are really, what are they and why? Now, to understand that, a literature has emerged and you're engaging with that literature. Now, a good portion of that literature, because of the nature of the subject, Shinrin Yoku, and the subjects, people, a good portion of that literature comes with particular problems. To understand those problems, we need to talk through the way that experiments are designed and how they need to be conducted and what the key concepts are behind their conduct. But before we get there, let's think about different types of studies. The most basic thing that we do as researchers is that we make observations. We go out, as I do, out into the environment and we make observations in space. And we, we don't just see things, we observe particular patterns. For example, in 2019, 2018 it is now, 2018, I went out to go and collect some tree ring samples for a chronology I was building to reconstruct temperature variability in the Alps here in Australia. And while I was there, I observed this pattern in space that since then has become known as snow gum dieback. So a casual thing I saw became an attribute of interest. Something that we then set about measuring and started testing. Now, that there wasn't an experiment in the first place is not a problem. But we made observations and then formalised those observations with some measurements. Now, whether we do that or not in the field when we observe things, it's important to recognise that before you get to the point where experiments are being run and we're testing things quantitatively, that observations, anecdotal observations, form the basis of a good many of the research activities that we undertake. It's sort of almost haphazard, or things that we've conducted in other experiments that we've conducted and observations we've made during those, those experiments. Observations always, always lead our research activities. So a hallmark of a good researcher, I suppose, is being observant, being patient, and being able to place 
things that we observe in terms of differences and changes into some kind of formalized pattern in our mind in which we can test. Now once we have made those observations, generally the next step we take is to formulate a model and then set about conducting an experiment and interpreting the outcome of that experiment. Now behind me I've grayed out two components, the hypothesis and the null hypothesis. Those two terms are things that we will come back to in week six and discuss then. But bear in mind, we start with, uh, we're going to observation, observational studies. I've just talked about those. But bear in mind, I'll just talk about them for a moment. Bear in mind that observational studies are just those, ones that we make in space, and then we seek to identify changes or differences in what we see around us we, tend, we try to associate that with um, explanations. One example is, for example, on Black Mountain, where we see a difference between aspects in terms of species composition. And then we try to relate that observable difference in composition to different aspects. We look for a response or an independent variable, a response, the composition, the stems per hectare or density of different species. And then we use an independent variable, something to explain it, perhaps the aspect that the trees are facing. So some of our studies are entirely observational in nature. And the first studies we conducted of dieback, and a good portion of what we continue to do, is all observational. From those observational studies, I'll come back to the model now, from those observational studies, we arrive at some basic explanations perhaps, or theories about what is going on. So we use our observations to develop a model, a conceptual model in our mind. Perhaps we formalize it mathematically, but a model can be conceptual in nature. Something we never put down on paper, but something that a model within which we are working. So we try to describe with our model the mechanism or the process that is at play. And of course, as I said, there's no reason for us to necessarily mathematically formalize it. It could be just a simple cause and effect model that we have in our mind. Now, how do we progress from a mental model into something that we test? Well, what we need to recognize is that we need to go out and of course and collect or we need to conduct an experiment. We need to collect data. Now, bear in mind, that as we've covered so far, data are variable. And that's because error, intrinsic population error, is part of all the data that we collect. That means any data that we collect, say, from an, from an observational approach, could be infused with population level error that prevents us from determining a real characteristic of the system. So if we actually are dealing with differences between species composition, but the data are so highly variable that we cannot distinguish it, that variability hides that underlying real characteristic of the system we're working with. So what we seek to do is to minimize this induced component of variability in our data set. Minimize all of this measurement-based error, sampling error, all these accidents and mistakes, we minimize that so that we are focused entirely, or as much as possible, on the real characteristic of the system that we're interested in testing. This is what we're trying to avoid. This is what we're trying to capture. Bear in mind that both real and induced variation are the product of error. And error, as you know, are natural attributes of any data set. So to progress then into, the, into a data set that lets us test the real characteristics of a system, experiments are the mainstay of academic research, especially in the sciences. The experiments let us test a specific hypothesis, a testable idea, a testable question that we have. 
that is bounded by clear limits on what type of data and what, what the metric is as well. Now, how do we set up experiments? What are the key attributes to setting up experiments? Bearing in mind that there are any number of experiments that we can conduct between the vast array of fields out there in research. There is no way I can cover all of the possible considerations. But what I can do is give you the key concepts that are common to all experiments. First, before we get into those, understand that an experiment lets us test specific variables. We try to control or minimise variation in all other things that might confound the expression of the variable that's of interest. So we try to limit other sources of variability so that the primary source of variability is the effect that we have of interest. Now we might seek to modify that variable of interest ourselves. We might seek to manipulate the conditions or we could observe differences in conditions that we find naturally in space. The distinction between those two is the distinction between what we would refer to as a natural as opposed to a controlled experiment. Here is an example of a natural experiment that a good friend of mine, Chloe, put to work through a few years ago. Chloe worked on alpine skinks and Chloe's work focused on the impact of ski infrastructure. So ski run as opposed to natural open spaces. Now what Chloe had to do of course was sample across ski areas and conservation only areas but not by putting her traps anywhere but by putting them into similar types of environments. Here a ski run full of grass, here a grassy meadow. So, this, so the conditions of the system are very, very similar, with one exception. One's ski resort and the other not, and they have different management. Now this is a natural experiment. The conditions for Chloe's experiment exist already. So the conditions reflect conditions in the real world. And that means when data are collected from natural experiments, we can directly apply them to conditions in the real world. They're directly applicable to systems that arise naturally. That means that they're generalizable to that system that's being studied. Often, because we, especially in environmental fields, are dealing with large systems that are very complex, ecosystems, large systems that are complex and possible to replicate in a controlled setting. Well, the only way we can conduct experiments on ecosystems meaningfully is in place. And often it's not permissible or it's just impossible for us to control the circumstances that lead to variability or we're just not allowed to. So we look for opportunities where distinctions exist naturally to develop or use a natural experiment. One of the problems though, is that these results, the results that come from natural experiments can be limited in, ter limited in terms of their generalizability. That is, Chloe's data, for example, are very relevant for grassy areas inside a subalpine setting. You can't necessarily apply that to other locations, other ecosystems, because of, not because of the fact that it was conducted there, but because of all the other factors that may be affecting expression of skink behaviour or numbers in this space because of, as I've already mentioned, the complexity of ecosystems. Now, because of that, because of that specificity to a setting, and because of all the other variables and factors that might play a role, it means that we cannot at times, in many instances from natural experiments, extract 
key conceptual attributes, key fundamental properties that let us place our observations within a, a hard set of theories that we can then apply conceptually elsewhere. The other problem that we face with experiments like this is that it can be difficult to replicate the conditions that we're working in, especially if those conditions are highly specific. There aren't many instances in which paired locations of ski runs and grassy meadows can be paired so that they really are replicates of each other with one exception and that is that one's a ski run and one isn't. So replication can be a challenging exercise. Now there is an alternative of course to a natural experiment and that's this one, a controlled experiment in which all of the variability, we seek to control all variability except the variability associated with the thing we're interested in testing. Now that's great because then we can generate data that give us specific insight to the effect of that variable and that supports the erection of clear theories and explanation of theories that are based upon the direct effect of one variable. Now the problem in doing so is that because these are these kind of experiments, they might be in aquaculture or in a greenhouse or in a lab, because these experiments control everything except for the variable of interest, that the focus of the research itself may omit really important factors. Now an example of that in my own career was when we were working on the impact of CO2 enrichment. So elevate, so we deliberately increased the concentration of carbon dioxide in greenhouses and then examined the direct effects on eucalypt growth. And we looked across different families of, of eucalypts within the same genus, within the same species, to identify whether there were specific genotypes that were performing better in high CO2. Now, one thing that we consistently saw, and this is very common in the CO2 literature, is that there was a short-term effect of CO2 stimulation. That is, when we increased CO2, the plants very expressed a very brief increase in growth, and then they cease doing that. Now, that does not necessarily replicate what happens in the natural world. And it took us a little while to work out why. While we were seeing a CO2 stimulation, it was very short-lived, and the reason we see in many cases a longer-lived expression of CO2 response in plants is because of the association they form with mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi draw down carbohydrates from the plants they're attached to, and the plants gain a benefit from the greater root network that, or effective root network that the mycorrhizae uh, provide. In the absence of mycorrhizal associations then, plants in greenhouses don't have that association. They don't have the drawdown of CO2. And in plants grown at high CO2, the increased concentration of carbohydrates in the plant itself leads to downregulation in photosynthesis, slowing their response to CO2. So by omitting mycorrhizal associations in a greenhouse, we, um, we eliminated a key effect of elevated CO2. Did it matter? It made a huge difference. We ran experiments subsequently with plants that were exposed to mycorrhizae and those that were not. Those that were not increased their productivity in high CO2 by 30%. Those that were given a mycorrhizal association increased their growth by 300%. So control experiments are great, but if you don't understand exactly what's going on, where the sensitivities sit, you may omit factors that are very important. So that means that we have an, a set of uh, data that are generalizable, so long as they're generalized only to a very narrow set of conditions that were applied during the experiment. It's up to you to decide whether you think that's generalizable or not. Of course, experiments like this take a great deal of work. Maintaining even a simple experiment in a greenhouse takes hours every day. 
constantly monitoring for insect or other pathogens, and then all the measurement that goes with it. The last thing to bear in mind is that even in the most controlled settings, variability is still present. Plants grown on the north side of a, of a greenhouse bay as opposed to the south side if they're near the door. All sorts of factors can affect variability in a laboratory. Just because you do it there doesn't mean that you're free of variability. So with that background behind us, what are the key elements to experiments, regardless of whether we're in the medical sciences, whether we're looking at fish, plants, or conducting other experiments in the lab? What are the key things that we are looking for? Well, here are the big five. Replication, the use of controls, randomization in the process, independence in terms of the data themselves, and where it's necessary, blinding, and it's always necessary, blinding of the subjects to the treatment. Now, I will cover those five concepts in the next piece focused on experimental design. See, I told you this would be short.